All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is the last part of, <clears throat> excuse me, reproduction. Uh, this is part four. Uh, we're looking at what happens when the sperm and the egg actually come together, and then what the end result is, and how we get that baby out of there. Okay, so fertilization, as we know, it's just the uh, sperm and the egg coming together. Uh, so it's when a haploid, so this means like the one N, which means one set of chromosomes fusing together with another one N. Uh, over ovum, so the egg, slash egg, to produce uh, the diploid zygote, so 2N, so two sets of chromosomes. The zygote is just what we call that uh, fused egg and sperm cell, and this happens in the oviduct, okay, so with the fallopian tubes. Uh, a lot of people ask why only one sperm can come in. Once that first sperm comes in there, once the enzymes in the acrosome uh, break through that egg, uh, once it enters, it kind of it creates a chemical change in the surrounding of the egg and doesn't allow other uh, enzymes to be active. So only one sperm can get in. Uh, meiosis two occurs in the egg with uh, fertilization. So once fertilization occurs, meiosis two will happen. So meiosis one happened in the ovary, whereas meiosis 2 happens in the oviduct, whereas in males, both uh, meiosis 1 and 2 happen in the testes. Uh, the next one, zygote develops into an embryo, so this is where it's going to go from uh, the one cell into two cells, into four, into eight, into 16, and then eventually it's going to differentiate uh, into organs and limbs. Okay, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Uh, once the embryo is uh, is created, so the zygote develops in the embryo. Uh, it takes several days until it actually implants, and it's because it's developing from the zygote into the embryo. Uh, once it does get into the uterus, it binds to and fuses with the endometrial wall. So that was the whole reason why uh, the endometrium was being built up and matured and becoming secreted with blood vessels for the last uh, 28 days, or I guess under 28 days. Okay, so again, you should have these things there in order for it to be the most uh, hospitable environment for that embryo to attach. Okay, so you can pause that and get it down. So here's just a very blurry picture of what's happening. So here's the zygote. Okay, so we have our sperm and our egg fused together. Uh, it starts differentiating, starts dividing. You might remember some grade 9, we had marula and blastula. So this is the next step at 16. And now this is our blastula that ends up uh, binding, implanting, and then we start developing uh, in week three, week four, and just continues. We start getting uh, central nervous system. We start getting hearts and limbs and teeth and ears and external anatomy. Okay, so as you can see, we're not going to go in. Th this can be a whole unit in itself on the differentiation into different tissues. So we're just going to say it differentiates into different tissues over the next nine months. Uh, here's just something interesting for you guys. This is all the first uh, embryos. So this is the beginning stage before they begin to differentiate. Um, let me just... No, we'll just erase that part. Uh, just so you can see it. So as you can see, this is what a fish looks like at the beginning. Salamander, tortoise, chicken, pig, etc. This is all the same uh, timeline. And then what they do is they differentiate into... Uh, their specific tissues and their specific organs with their specific limbs. As you can see, obviously and hopefully for us, we look different as the differentiation happens, but initially, um, due to evolution, is that we all look the same as our embryo. We look no different than a tortoise when we first start differentiating, which is kind of weird for people to think about. Okay, so now um, what happens is the placenta develops. So basically what it is, it's our nutrient sac, Okay, and it's uh, attached to our endometrial wall. And it's going to be connecting uh, to our fetus through the umbilical cord. And what it's going to be doing is it provides the fetus with nutrients and it expels waste. It gives the good gas and gets rid of the CO2. So we get the oxygen and, they, and then you can give away the CO2. Right, so basically gas exchange. Okay, so you can pause that to get it down. And we'll get into some more detail specifically of what, about what vessels are going in and which ones are going out. Uh, what else the placenta does, and this is a really important one, it uh, produces HCG called hum human chorionic gonadotropic hormone. Uh, chorionic 
or the chorion is basically just a tissue layer that separates the body from the placenta. Don't need to know too much about that. Gonadotropin, which we talked about before, uh, releases hormones from the gonads, from the ovaries, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So what the HCG does is it, it's a hormone, and it travels in the blood, and it tells the corpus luteum to keep producing estrogen and progesterone. Because if there's an embryo that's attached there, we don't want menstruation to, to happen. So usually at day 28, corpus luteum shuts down, menstruation happens and, and floods out anything that's in there. Obviously, we don't want that to happen. So since the corpus luteum is still producing, um, the endometrial layer stays intact. The placenta is actually able to start secreting its own estrogen progesterone around uh, month three. And so once that happens, then the corpus luteum shuts down. Okay. Oops, sorry, you might want to go back and pause that. Okay, so... Jump, th jump forward about 10 months to uh, delivery. So how does the delivery process actually happen? Well, once the fetus is, is full term, so usually around uh, you know, 36 to 40 weeks, the fetus is starting to put a lot of pressure on the cervix. Once it gets to a certain point, that cervix sends a neural message, so a message uh, through the nervous system, to the posterior pituitary. So we talked about the anterior, that means the front of the pituitary. Now we have the posterior, which is the back. And what it does is it releases a hormone called oxytocin. This is not produced in the uh, posterior pituitary like the other ones are produced in the anterior pituitary. This one's actually produced in the hypothalamus and just stored in the uh, posterior pituitary, kind of like the liver and gallbladder relationship. So what it does when it releases the oxytocin, it travels in the blood and it heads to the myometrium, which is just the muscle layer of the uterus. And what it does is it tells that myometrium to contract. When it does, those muscles start pushing more on the fetus. And what that does is it puts more pressure on the cervix. And so since there's pressure on the cervix, it continues to send a signal to the posterior pituitary, which again causes the oxytocin to be released, myometrium to contract, more pressure on the fetus. And so you can see the more that's released, the more pressure, the more pressure, the more that's released. This is called a positive feedback loop. Okay? So this one's an uh, important one. Okay, so here's just it again. You can pause it to look over it again. But besides that, that's a, that's about it for us. Okay, so making sure we know where fertilization takes place, uh, making sure that we know the placenta. That's the big one for this one. What it's doing and what it's actually producing in terms of hormones, and then finally uh, the positive feedback loop. Okay, have a good day.